Hi, I'm Vishnu Srinivas and welcome to Hawk Guide. I started this podcast to give professionals an open platform to share their candid views on topics impacting businesses and economies around the world. Make sure to rate, review, and subscribe. Joining me today is Brad Setzer. He is a senior research fellow at the CFR. Uh, thanks so much for taking the time to speak with me today. Oh, my pleasure. Awesome. So do you want to uh, start off with a quick uh, introduction about your background and your role? Uh, sure. I'm Brad Setzer. Um, I'm a senior fellow at the Council on Foreign Relations. Um, previously, I've uh, worked in the uh, Biden administration and the trade office uh, in the Obama administration, mostly at the U.S. Treasury. Uh, at the IMF, and then I've had a couple of uh, roles in uh, private financial institutions over time. Um, and I'm uh, a balance of payments analyst at heart. I track uh, the global economy by tracking the balance of payments data. Uh, one side of that is sort of the trade data, but also the income that multinational companies report they earn abroad or around the world and how that impacts uh that enters into the current account, but then also financial flows uh, and, and big reserve accumulation, deaccumulation, uh, and like kind of some big institutional investors who have a, a large aggregate impact on capital flows, even if they are not uh, a central bank. Awesome. Yeah. So hopefully we can get into uh, some of those other topics you touched on. But first, uh, speaking to your role uh, currently, what would you say is the most challenging aspect uh, of working um, at the CFR in your current role? Oh, uh, I mean, it's, I don't know that the CFR has got any particularly uh, challenging aspects other than uh, occasionally uh, having to do the paperwork to make sure that I have the ac access to all the data I need to do my work. Um, the CFR is a great place to work, so uh, I can't really complain. Um, you know, on a on a day to day basis, sometimes the hardest things are you know you're just missing one one component or uh, one data series that would uh, help you sort out uh, and, and answer more effectively a complex problem. But without that one data series, you can't quite figure things out. And sometimes it's hard to find the the Rosetta Stone, the single data set. So the frustrating thing is when you think you figured out where you can find a, a little a little time series and then it it it's just beyond your reach right so kind of tying into that how would you say like you go about your research process in terms of investigating these various things uh like p pieces of data from various sources or going through balance sheets oh uh well i uh, over time i've uh built a number of Excel spreadsheets that I use to watch trade flows, to watch uh, reserve growth. Uh, and sometimes, and then a, 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 a similar set to track the balance of payments data for some of the major countries. And I think like watching that data and seeing what's happening and what's changing and what's interesting is sort of my main source of inspiration and ideas. Uh, I also, uh, uh, make use of various uh, investor publications uh, for debt restructuring cases. Um, most countries uh, put out a, a, a high quality presentation uh, that outlines how they got into trouble and kind of the scope of their debts. Um, and then I spend a lot of time looking through IMF documents. Sometimes recently I've been doing some stuff on corporate taxation. So I look through corporate disclosure, but it's you know, it's it's going through documents, uh, looking for numbers usually. Yeah, definitely. Um, and you spoke a bit about the a debt restructuring. Kind of that's where I'd like to start, um, because I remember last year on the podcast I, I was discussing the Sri Lanka default crisis, um, and you know, obviously there's some fallout from that now. Um, recently, I think the IMF gave them a bailout of in some billions of dollars or some something like that. Um, I guess how does an event like this shape a country's approach? Uh, to debt restructuring? Well, Sri Lanka defaulted uh, like now well over a year ago. Uh, Sri Lanka actually waited too long to default. They probably should have defaulted two years ago. They ran, uh, they literally defaulted because they ran out of money. They should have, they could easily have anticipated that they were going to run out of money 
and they could have started a restructuring process a bit earlier, uh, saved them a, a bit of foreign exchange and been in a better position after they uh, defaulted. I mean, Sri Lanka for a while was struggling to pay for, for fuel and was relying on help from India to pay for food. It was, um, it was pretty dire. Uh, you know, I think the challenge all countries face when they default is default is recognition of financial failure. So recognition that your financial and economic management didn't succeed, that you lost access to global debt markets, that in many cases you lost have lost access to uh, financing from even your geopolitical allies, and you really were or were are in a position uh, where by failing to pay, you're admitting that your approach to economic management hasn't succeeded. So in Sri Lanka's case, it was appropriately tied to a political change political crisis um and then once you default you you a couple of things happen one is uh you technically enter into a bit of legal jeopardy uh if you're defaulting on an international bond uh the bond investors have a right to pursue certain uh legal remedies to enforce their claims now as a practical matter it is very hard to actually collect anything from a sovereign uh, but you do uh, have to pay a bit more attention to your financial affairs. Uh, you generally is you need a good lawyer. Um, uh, and you need to start a process uh, for reaching agreement on a new payment schedule. Um, uh, default is a recognition you can't pay your bonds on their and your other loans on their contractual terms. So you essentially need to exchange an old contract that you cannot uh, honor for a new contract that you will be able to honor. And so that means typically negotiating with the IMF uh, about a program that sets out how much money the IMF is going to give you in the near term, but also sets out some limits on how much you can pay uh, during the the period of the IMF restru uh, economic restructuring and then over time. Uh, Sri Lanka has faced a particular challenge because it was hard to get an IMF program. Uh, and the reason, main reason why it was hard to get an IMF program is that for, uh, in order to get an IMF program under the IMF's current policies, your major government to government creditors have to agree uh, that the program's financing assumptions make sense and implicitly commit to restructuring their the money that Sri Lanka owes them uh, on the terms set out in the IMF program. And China was very reluctant to do that. And that held up uh, Sri Lanka's uh, uh, IMF program for quite some time. Um, and then like, you know, it's, it's, it's widely been discussed. It is, and it is sort of not only, like sometimes things are widely discussed when they're, they shouldn't be. Um, and sometimes things are widely discussed because they should be. Um, and China's uh, emergence as a global creditor uh, has gotten a lot of attention because it it really is a big change, and it really has changed the restructuring process in a host of different ways. Now, Sri Lanka actually owes more on its commercial bonds than it owes to China. Um, Zambia is the opposite case. It owes more to China than it owes to its commercial bonds. Um, and then China is, it's, is itself a complex uh, set of institutions. Um, you know, you negotiate to some degree with China's government, the finance ministry or the central bank, uh, but most of the credit has been extended by the development banks uh, or policy banks, China Development Bank and the Export Import Bank of China. So figuring out how to negotiate with China means figuring out how to negotiate with some very specific institutions inside China. Uh, and I think it's fair to say that the no one has yet figured out quite how to successfully convince either of the two key institutions to really make uh, important concessions uh, on their their lending. You also have to like have a process for reaching agreement with your bonds. Start talking to your bonds. Start devising a new exit in, a new bond that they will accept. And sometimes the bonds will challenge aspects of the IMF's program. So there's a it is a, 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 a typically a lengthy process, but it's become longer over time uh, because of the delays uh, to you know to, 
to be fair, I mean, to be honest, are mostly delays because of complexities of dealing with China. Yeah. In terms of, you know, specific debt restructuring programs, this is a pretty interesting case because, you know, like reading an article of yours recently, uh, investors are apparently requesting GDP linked bond payments for Sri Lanka. Uh, I guess, where would you say contingent instruments make sense in what kinds of scenarios? Look, uh, I think academics tend to be more fond of contingent instruments than most bond investors. Uh, in most cases, contingent instruments uh, have been uh, poorly received by the market and traded at a big discount relative to their underlying value. Uh, I think there are ways they can play more important roles in some restructurings, uh, but I think in order for them to pay, play more important roles, uh, two things need to happen. Uh, one is, in order to really be uh, an important component of a country's debt structure, they have to be included in a big share of the bonds. If you put uh, like a contingent instrument in at the very end of a negotiation to give investors an extra two cents, it's not going to materially affect the country's debt sustainability. Uh, a truly uh, significant contingent instrument needs to be in the majority of the debt. Um, so for Zambia, I think it would actually be easy uh, technically to link, uh, say, the payment of a coupon to the price, global price of copper, something that's beyond Zambia's control, but which really impacts uh, uh, Zambia's capacity to pay. So I think the first principle is that if you're going to do it, you really should do it. It shouldn't just be an extra add-on for a couple of cents thrown in at the end of the negotiations. Um, I think the second principle is investors have to show, uh, in some cases, that they're really willing uh, to pay up for the optionality. Uh, what I've argued in Sri Lanka's case is that the traditional use of GDP warrants in a restructuring is to provide a couple of cents at the end of the process to let investors who give up a bit of face value have an, uh, a possibility of getting full recovery. Uh, but I think that the treating, uh, in this case, a GDP warrant as an add-on tends to mean the country gives away uh, a certain payment Prob pro certain probability of payments tends to, to be often fairly expensive uh, without getting a lot in return. So if investors really want GDP warrants, I think they have should be giving up uh, actual cash flows. So I think it makes sense to not treat them as a, as a gift that every bond investor gets for participating in the exchange, but as an option. Investors who really want the GDP warrant would take fewer nominal bonds. Um, and then uh, I think those are the main uh, uh, constraints or views I have on that. Yeah. Oh, sense. I guess actually I'll leave it out a, a third one, actually probably the most important one. Uh, it doesn't, doesn't always apply, but it mostly applies. It, I, th I think the most promising subset of contingent instruments are contingent instruments that are actually structured as bonds, not as warrants. Mm -hmm. uh, it sort of gets financy and technical, uh, but, you know, a bond has a face value and a coupon payment. Right. Um, and it's eligible for, you know, it's something that pe people who invest in bonds and in emerging market bonds can hold and value. And so to me, uh, there's ways of structuring instruments that have a sort of uh, have the character of adjusting payments down in the event of a bad shock but are still very clearly bonds. The easiest one is a maturity extension option. Um, you have The issuer has the option of extending the bond for two years. So a five-year bond becomes a seven-year bond. From the point of view, an investor is actually a seven-year bond that can be called after five. It's easy to price. It's something that's always priced in the corporate bond world. Uh, but I also think that, say, for Zambia, having a bond whose coupon steps down that's reduced to a significantly lower level and whose maturity extends if copper prices fall is a way of building in a bit of protection against a copper price shock and retaining an instrument that is fundamentally a bond, not something that is more equity like. Yeah, I would say, I would say that makes sense for the most part. Uh, where I want to shift to next is, you know, kind of stepping back to 20 or so, you know, when Trump took office, 
there were all these talks about how the world was moving towards an era of deglobalization in terms of trade barriers and moving out from China. Uh, but recently we've seen China's auto exports have taken off as of late and projected to shoot up even further, um, not to mention, obviously, China, China is still leading in the semiconductor industry. So I guess, what do you take away from the whole deglobalization thesis that people have um, promoted over the past few years? Well, what I have generally taken away from that discussion is that uh, there are a lot of people who pay attention to press narratives uh, who don't bother to dive deeply into the numbers. Um, the numbers have really never suggested meaningful deglobalization, uh, nor do I think that one would reasonably have expected on the basis of Trump's uh, tariffs, which is or the policy that was introduced uh, to, to change the dynamics of the bilateral trade relationship between the U.S. and China, that you would meaningfully deglobalize China from the entire world economy. The U.S. was alone in imposing the tariffs. It wasn't going to uh, lead China to trade less with Europe or trade less with the Middle East or trade less with Latin America. Was, the U.S. put those tariffs in place alone. So you wouldn't have expected much of a global response and you didn't see it. Uh, but it's also actually, I think, much harder than most people realize to really change patterns of trade just with uh, tariffs. Uh, when you look at it empirically, there's a gap between the U.S. and the Chinese data, but the, uh, a surprisingly large number of U.S. companies uh, just decided to pay the tariff on their imports. They couldn't disentangle their supply chains in the near term. Uh, Trump actually exempted Apple from the tariffs because he didn't want to handicap Apple relative to Samsung, which was uh, doing final assembly in Vietnam. And then the tariff only applies if the good is you know, assembled in its final instance in China. So if you unpackage it uh, at a part in Vietnam and put it back together, it's a Vietnamese good. So it's really hard to, on the basis of a bilateral tariff, to, to really uh, change the structure of supply change. Companies move in ways to get around the tariff without really changing how they conduct their their business. What I've noted, and uh, uh, I think this is well supported in the global data, uh, is that we had, you know, obviously Trump represented a shift in the dominant uh, political view around trade in the United States. It was, you know, Trump didn't want to do TPP. He put in place tariffs on China. Uh, the rhetoric around cha trade changed dramatically. Uh, but if you look at what China has actually, and China, there were some some changes in China's approach to the world. Xi Jinping has 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 emphasized uh, reducing China's own supply chain dependence in his own uh, policies. Uh, pol in many cases, policies that were put in place well before Trump and well before the the, the semiconductor export restrictions. But what you see in the actual data is China is exporting more as a share of its GDP than ever before. What you see in the data is that Chinese exports are at a record share of world GDP. And what happened during the pandemic uh, runs against the deglobalization thesis. The world's demand shifted towards goods. China is the epicenter of manufacturing for most goods. And so that shift in demand towards goods was a shift in demand towards China. <laughs> Moreover, China, like didn't actually stimulate household consumption to get through the pandemic. Uh, Xi Jinping has been very reluctant to write checks to, to China's citizens, uh, households. Uh, and instead, in some sense, China free rode on the stimulus that others provided to their households, which led to this enormous increase in, in their demand for Chinese goods. So in that sense, I think it is it is important to you know pay attention to the political discussion but also to understand what is happening in the numbers. And auto exports are a great example of that. I mean, China has gone from essentially being an importer of German luxury cars and a few Japanese luxury cars to being a big exporter of electric vehicles while the world was talking about deglobalization because China built up a, a very impressive production capacity in electric vehicles and has an edge there. Yeah, and, and speaking more specifically to this US-China dynamic, you know, there's obviously been calls for an effort to disassociate U.S. 
uh, the U.S. from China in terms of, you know, getting semiconductor manufacturing to be more streamlined in the U.S. Uh, do you think there's merit uh, to doing that? And do you think it's feasible? Well, uh, you know, I think the semiconductor issue is actually a bit more complicated than that because uh, uh, the leading edge of semiconductor production had never shifted to China. The leading edge of semiconductor production uh, was once upon a time in the U.S. and then it moved to being in the U.S., Korea, and Taiwan. And then Intel, which was the, the U.S. company at the leading edge, uh, lagged TSMC. Uh, Taiwan's leading company, TSMC, in introducing extreme ultraviolet lithography. We've all learned a lot about semiconductors uh, with the whole focus on supply chains. So mm -hmm. before, five years ago, few people would have understood extreme ultraviolet lithography, myself included. But the U.S. was actually lagging. China's also lagging. Uh, everyone was lagging Taiwan, TSMC, in their capacity to produce the fastest uh, chips. So there's a component which is making sure uh, that the U.S. Uh, returns to being at the frontier of semiconductor manufacturing technology, uh, that Intel upgrades its capacity and starts to match TSMC, that TSMC does a bit more investment in the U.S., uh, and so it has uh, capabilities in the U.S. that are similar to its capabilities in Taiwan. I think the U.S. will succeed at that. I think there's a real bipartisan political commitment. There's a lot of money behind it. And fundamentally, I don't think there's any reason why the U.S. cannot be at the frontier of chip manufacturing. We were at the frontier of chip manufacturing for most of the post-World War II era. It's only recently that we've fallen behind. There's a separate question about how dependent we want to be on Chinese production of some of the lagging chips, where China has just thrown tons and tons of money at making chips, it hasn't gotten to the frontier, but there's a lot of capacity inside China. Mm -hmm. um, and there, I think uh, it does make sense to not be uh, sole source dependent to the extent that that's possible, to make sure that there is uh, capacity for lagging edge chips outside of China. Why does that make sense? Well, look, uh, to be blunt, we're using chips as a weapon against Russia. Everyone now knows how to use chips in a sanctions context. And uh, one would want to minimize that kind of vulnerability for national security reasons. But, you know, you have to pay some attention to the cost. And one reasonable, uh, in my view, approach is not to, to write, you know, make every manufacturer remove chips made in China from every device. I mean, that would, we would lose access to a lot of washing machines and the like. Uh, but it probably does make sense to have the capability to produce most of the chips that we need for key goods uh, outside of China. I'm sure China wants the capacity to produce those chips for its own use inside China as well. So there'll be a little bit more of a, uh, a little more redundancy, but a little more resilience. Yeah, there's still going to be a lot of trade, though. I mean, even if we make the advanced chips in the U.S., in most cases, the testing will be done outside the U.S. Final assembly into a, a laptop or a phone will be done outside the U.S. Uh, but, you know, I think the, the focus on making sure the U.S. stays at the leading edge of semiconductor technology is appropriate. Yeah. And in regards to you know, China's auto exporting, I think we've also seen, you know, with the U.S. trade deficit you know, increasing by a sizable percentage, you know, in 2022, uh, obviously, along with the dollar strengthening. Um, which is on the other hand, China swinging the other direction uh, with a huge trade sur surplus in 2022 as well. Do you envision, you know, these trends for both these countries continuing, uh, especially with supply chains still being in, in somewhat of a disarray? Look, I think the big increase in the U.S. deficit and the biggest increase in China's surplus came in 2021, and that the pace of increase actually moderated a bit in 2022. Um, uh, the U.S. Uh, trade deficit in, on a monthly basis is, is somewhat down off its peaks, uh, and the supply, supply chains have become to some degree unsnarled, like West Coast ports are no longer bottled, blocked up. Right. Um, 
so I, I, I expect that broadly speaking, uh, we will kind of move away from the sort of very specific effects of the pandemic, the shift towards goods, so forth and so on, uh, into a, a new equilibrium. Uh, that new equilibrium will be defined on one hand by some of the strategic investments that the U.S. and Europe are making to increase their capabilities in certain uh, technologies judged strategically important. Now, in the short run, there's sort of some technical things. When you increase investment, you tend to increase imports. So it doesn't impact your trade deficit, even if the goal is to eventually be able to produce things that you now import. Um, but then the second factor is, you know, the dollar is still pretty strong not quite as strong as it was at times last year. Uh, and I think the dollar is at a level uh, where it will be very difficult for the US trade deficit to fall further. Um, you know, some of the supply chain effects and shift towards goods rather than services had an impact that pushed the trade deficit up to like a super high level in early 2022, it's come down a bit. And I kind of expect it to slowly widen with current policies over time. But I think there's a fair question about whether the dollar will adjust further. Uh, I personally think it probably has to just because it's, it's still too strong relative to history and too strong relative to the uh, external side of the U.S. economy. Yeah, and there's obviously a lot of talk right now about de-dollarization. Do you buy this notion that countries like China and Russia um, are moving away from the dollar as a long-term play? Look, Russia clearly is moving away from the dollar. It's also moving away from the euro. Um, and we kind of forced it to. I mean, the, the point of the G7 sanctions was to make it really hard for Russia to make payments in dollars or euros for a lot of goods. Um, in some cases, we've made it impossible uh, for certain Russian banks to transact in dollars and euros. Uh, the US and the EU collectively have immobilized Russia's reserves um and you know the eu has gone even in us too technically although it's sort of irrelevant because we weren't buying much russian oil to begin with but the eu has made it impossible even if you wanted to to pay for to import russian oil it's like you know like, there's some exceptions hungary and a pipeline and blah, 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 but for for the bulk of russia's oil trade they can't sell to europe and euros dollars yuan doesn't matter so the natural effect of this kind of comprehensive sanctions is very clearly that Russia needs to look for alternative means of payments and alternative markets. Uh, Europe was its biggest market for its energy. Europe's not buying. On oil, Europe said we won't buy. And gas, natural gas, Russia said we won't ship it through the pipeline. So, of course, Russia's uh, looking for other markets and they need to find alternative means of payment. I think I think that's not de that that is there is some genuine de-dollarization, also de-euroization. China's mm -hmm. trade with China was mostly in euros, not dollars, to be honest. Uh, but that is forced de-dollarization, fo forced de-euroization by our sanctions. It's not a voluntary choice. Sure. So um, but China is also looking to try to reduce some of its uh sanctions vulnerability in the current geostrategic environment and so i think they are looking to expand the use of the yuan beyond russia uh i suspect there will be limits to how far that process goes but it is there's clearly an effort in that direction sure so would, would you say like this is kind of uh premeditated on the u.s part because i i assume there will be some sort of impact they will face from losing status as like a reserve currency Dominate, no, dominate. We, no, like let's re no, we are not losing. First of all, uh, I hate the term the status of the dollar as a reserve currency. The dollar had a particular status in Bretton Woods when it had a link to gold and everybody else was linked to the dollar. Mm -hmm. When the Bretton Woods agreement collapsed, the dollar was just one currency amongst many. It was the most important currency in the global system. It is the most important. Uh, reserve currency. It is not the only reserve currency, nor is the only or is it the only currency used for global transactions. It it has a big it has an outsized role, but status to me is like kind of the wrong way of describing it. Right. It's stat. It's custom, um, and it is the fact that you know, frankly, uh, the dollar offers a, a lot of characteristics for a country that has reserves that are hard to replicate. The treasury market is by far the most liquid government bond market in the world. 
way more liquid than any bond market in Europe, way more liquid than the market for yuan denominated uh, Chinese government bonds. The dollar also like treasuries yielded more than most European bonds for a long time. Negative interest rates were uh, a tax on reserve holdings in euro. So euro had a de-euroization policy for a while, not because they wanted to reduce the euro's use as a global reserve currency, mm -hmm. but because they wanted, um, for monetary policy reasons, really low interest rates, and that naturally weakened the euro. The dollar, because of its basic useful qualities, it's a really good reserve, treasuries are a really good reserve asset, better than anything anyone else puts out. Mm -hmm. Uh, and the dollar has great uh, network externalities. You can make payments in dollars for anything around the world. And country, you know, a, a country in South America that wants to trade with a country in Africa, can, they can both agree to make payments in dollars and no one will worry about it. They can make those payments through non-US banks. And, it, you know, it, it just, it, it happens. The global system was built over in the post-war era to transact efficiently in dollars. To be honest, you can also do the damn same, you know, the same damn thing in euros with no real problem. Um, and I think over time, it's not unrealistic to think that there will be increased use of the Chinese yuan in payments. The only real questions are whether the yuan will be used in payments that don't touch China or just with China's own trade, and whether the yuan will be used to denominate uh, global financial assets, uh, which is, and though in those two roles, I think the yuan faces some real challenges. But to call this a status, to talk of dollar dominance, to me is kind of, it, it elevates this to a level that it shouldn't have. What, the dollar was dominant as a transaction, uh, as a, the, a means of exchange inside Europe after World War II, because Europe was uh, decimated by the war. Uh, because Bretton Woods made all currencies linked to dollars. Over then the course of the 1970s and 1980s, Europe moved towards a system where more and more payments were in Deutschmark and then euros. And that didn't threaten the US in any way. We kind of, we, we can't treat every uh, use of another currency for trade and international transactions as a threat to us. We need to be much more clear about where the real threats to our interests are. In my mm -hmm. view. Yeah. So, so to wrap up this discussion, uh, there's the school of thought that you know this de-dollarization will impacts the U.S. ability to continue to run trade deficits. Do you buy into that notion, or? Well, first of all, there's there's no really good evidence that there's de-dollarization other than in a narrow set of payments that directly touch China, in which case there will be no impact whatsoever. Um, uh, the uh, the second point is that uh, uh, and you know uh, Paul Krugman, uh, who's genuinely an exceptional international economist, uh, he won his Nobel for work in international economics has noted very accurately that there are a whole host of countries around the world that don't have the reserve currency uh, that are just advan normal advanced uh, economies that have no problem financing trade deficits in their own currency um, at rates that are very comparable to the rates the U.S. pays. I think there's a technical debate about whether if the world's share, the dollar share of world reserves went from 60 to 45, whether that would have a small impact on the treasury market, all else equal. But it would be a small impact and the impact would be dominated by changes in the Fed's policies over time. And it would not determine whether the US can or cannot run a trade deficit. Now there are states of the world where say the trade deficit is being financed by reserve accumulation in China and China's holding its exchange rate down. And if China stopped intervening to hold this exchange rate down uh, and, and the yuan appreciated and the dollar depreciated, the US would run a smaller trade deficit. Uh, and that would be basically a good thing. So um, I, I, I think that, that there, there's a bit more myth than reality in a lot of this debate. There's a there's a sense sometimes in some comments uh, that if the dollar were not used to to uh, denominate trade between China and Africa, the U.S. would no longer be a great power. A sense in which 
uh, the U.S.'s uh, position in the world isn't a function of the strength of the U.S. military, the airlift capacity of the U.S. Air Force, uh, our uh, carrier strike fleet, uh, our satellite capabilities, uh, the size of our market, the scale of the treasury market. And it is entirely a function of uh, what currency is used to denominate payments between uh, China and other countries. And I, I just don't think that's true. I think there's a whole bunch of reasons why the U.S. is a great power. Where the dollar's global use does have a real impact, it may have a small impact of, on our cost of funds at certain points of time. It may, in certain contexts, raise our trade deficit. But what it clearly affects is the uh, scope and scale of U.S. sanctions our capacity to extend sanctions. And it has been widely recognized, not the least by uh, former Treasury Secretary Jack Lew, that if you use the sanctions power to the max, by definition, you're going to incentivize countries to move away from the dollar, as we are seeing with Russia. That's a great way to put a bow on it. Um, thank you so much, Brad Setzer, for taking the time uh, to speak with me today. Really appreciate it. Hey, my pleasure. Good luck. I hope you enjoyed that. For more content, check out the rest of the videos on my channel. And be sure to look out every Thursday for a new episode.